Now that we know how to multiply a continuous time signal times an impulse function, we can talk about a very important property of the impulse function, namely what we call the sifting property. So let's say that I was wanting to compute the integral of the product between a continuous time signal x of t and our impulse function. In the last video, we learned how to multiply x of t times the impulse function. We know what happens. This continuous time signal is really zero everywhere, and we can replace it with just the impulse multiplied by a scalar. So if we do that in this case, think about what happens. This impulse is located at time zero, so I can replace this product with x at time zero times the impulse function. Since x at time zero is just a number, it's not a function of time, it can be brought outside of my time integral, so I can pull that right out front. I now am left with the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the impulse function, which we know by definition has an area of one. So this integral right here simplifies into my constant times one. My constant times one is just the constant. So what we've done is we've shown that this integral is just equal to the number x of zero. In other words, what this equation says is that the area under this product is simply equal to the value of my underlying signal at time zero. Another way of saying it is that this impulse function has sifted out one particular value of my function. By computing this product and the integral of it, what I've done is I've yielded one value of my underlying signal. And it's the value that corresponds to the location of the impulse function. So this is what we call the sifting property. If I am integrating the product of a signal with an impulse, the result of this integration is really just a number. So that's a very nice property. We can do something similar for a time-shifted impulse. So what if we wanted to multiply a continuous time si signal x of t times a time-shifted impulse function, and then we integrated that quantity. So again, in the last video, we learned how to simplify this product. We know what happens when we multiply a continuous time signal times a time-shifted impulse function. We end up with an impulse function at that time-shifted value scaled by the signal x of t when t equals capital T. So x at time t equals capital T is just a scalar. I can bring that outside my integral, and I'm left with integrating my time-shifted impulse function. So at this point, I need to figure out what the integral from minus infinity to infinity of delta of t minus capital T is equal to. We know by definition, if I was to integrate across an impulse response at time zero, I would get an area of one. So my gut tells me this is probably equal to one. Who cares where it's located? If I integrate across it, I get a one. Since I'm integrating from minus infinity to infinity, I end up integrating across this impulse located at time t equals capital T. So my gut tells me this integral should be equal to one. We can be a little bit more formal with that if we'd like. On this next line, what I've done is I have done a change of variable. If we let alpha equal t minus capital T, so alpha equals t minus capital T, then if I differentiate both sides, that tells me that d alpha equals dt, so I can replace the differential dt with d alpha. Also, from the equation alpha equals little t minus capital T, when little t is infinity, that means alpha would be infinity. And when little t is negative infinity, that means alpha would be minus infinity. So I have done a change of variable, and I've gone from an integration with respect to little t to integration with respect to alpha by just doing that very simple change of variable. Now this is in the form of our normal regular definition. This is an impulse located at zero on the alpha axis, and we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity on the alpha axis. So this, by definition, is equal to one. So when I'm all done doing this integration, what do I get? I get out a value of my underlying signal. Again, my impulse function has sifted out a single value of the continuous time signal. In this case, since the impulse function was located at time t equals capital T, it sifted out the value of my signal at time capital T. 
So this chart just provides a nice summary about some of the things that we have learned about the impulse function. Number one says that when I multiply a continuous time signal times an impulse located at time t naught, I end up with an impulse at time t naught scaled by the value of my signal at that time. This is really an application or really a statement of the sifting property. If I integrate a product, I end up with a value of my signal located or at the time where the impulse is located. So this is really just the sifting property we look at. Number three, we don't use too often, but sometimes it's nice to know that delta of t is equal to delta of minus t. It is this even function, so to speak. This right here is just another way of stating the sifting property. Here we are taking a product between x of t and an impulse at time t equals t naught. So after I integrate, I end up with my signal at time t naught. Something very similar happens if I've time shifted x of t plus t naught. So this is an impulse at time t equals zero. So I end up with whatever this signal is, replace t with zero. So if t is zero, I'm just left with t naught and I get t naught. Number six says it doesn't really matter what you call the integration variable. Usually we think of it as time t, but if I think of it as t or think of it as lambda or think of it as alpha, all the math still holds. This right here is an impulse located at t equals lambda on the axis. So if I, um, no, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. This is on the lambda axis. So when lambda is equal to t, that's where this is located. So this impulse is located at lambda equals t, which means to use the sifting property, I would replace lambda with t, and indeed, that's what I get. Number seven addresses the fact that sometimes when you perform the integration of the product of x of t and an impulse, you might not integrate across the impulse. So if I happen to perform integration from t1 to t2, and that does not include where this impulse is located, think about what I'm integrating then. I'm just integrating zeros the entire time. So if I happen to integrate the region that doesn't contain an impulse, I get zero. Not too surprising there. That's what calculus tells us. If I do happen to integrate across the impulse, even if t1 and t2 are not infinity, then I can still get out and sift out the value of my signal. These last two we haven't really gotten to yet because we haven't defined what the signal u of t is, but that'll be in the next um, video. So let's go ahead and talk about them briefly. In just a minute, we're going to introduce a quantity called the unit step function. So the unit step function is zero for all time, and then it turns on at time zero to the value one, and it holds that value of one for all time. It turns out there's a nice relationship between this unit step function and our unit impulse function. Namely, if I differentiate u of t, I get delta of t. And then from calculus, we can know we can go the other way. I can actually get u of t by integrating delta of t. So the unit step function and the delta function are related via differentiation and integration. And once we define the unit step function, that will be more clear in the next video.